the story simply as to a little child. For I am weak and weary and helpless and defiled. Tell me the old, old story. about you, but I'm never going to get tired of that story. Thank you, Natalia, for playing the piano. I asked her last minute, so she did great. <laughs> Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, this evening as we come before you, uh, we are just so thankful that we are given another opportunity to open your word. And Lord, we just pray that uh, as we talk a little bit about your story, Lord, that uh, it's not what I have to say, it's not how I say it, but it's how you allow the Spirit to hear, um, for us to hear it. Lord, we want to hear your voice, uh, we want to hear your words, and we want to follow your will. And we just pray this evening that uh, this weekend has given us a better understanding of your will for our lives, and more importantly, a confidence to go out into the world and to share what you have done in our lives, to share our story, to share how you have worked in and through our lives, to share how this is not the end, but simply the beginning. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I, I feel like, um, well, we started off on Friday night, and I told you my story, and I feel like I left you guys hanging, because I talked a little bit about my story, and I talked about the fact that I did not get baptized, right? So, that's right. So, I was wondering if anybody was going to go back through the records and say, hey, this guy's an elder of the church. How is he an elder of the church when he never got baptized? So, I wanted, I wanted to come back and finish that whole story out so you can rest at ease tonight. Uh, <laughs> I did get baptized. 
And it was between that age 13 and 14 and when uh, I went my senior year to Wava that that transition took place. And as I talked about baptism, I talked about how um, it's a, it's a life-changing decision. Now, it might not change your life in that moment, right? Because salvation is a work of a lifetime. But it, it's a choice where we decide, hey, I am accepting Jesus into my life personally. And I want everybody to know that he is my friend and savior. And it changes the narrative, as I said, from relying on your parents and how they have brought you up and what they've taught you and saying, okay, now this is my relationship, right? This is my choice. And so as that period went by and I was continuing to study and to learn and I was at Upper Columbia Academy, I was in the midst of a lot of things that were not necessarily things that would help me in that trajectory, but in the midst of that turmoil, in the midst of some of those things that weren't right, I began to see Jesus more clearly. And I feel that in this world, the more that maybe Satan tries to bog us down, if we prayerfully come to Jesus, we begin to see his light more clearly. And that was the case for me. And it happened to be the same case for my sister. My sister and I, like I said, were very close. And so on, in the summertime, we, we were in Montana. And I don't even know why we were in Montana that summer. Fact checkers there in the middle. But we happened to be in Montana. And uh, my sister and I were talking about it. And we both decided that we wanted to make that decision. And we made that decision because my uncle Alvaro, who was uh, very close to me, was in the neighborhood. And uh, we asked him if he'd baptize us in our creek at our property. And he said he would. And, uh, and so that Sabbath, my sister and myself and Ray's son, Jeff, all went down to the creek and got baptized in front of our family. And it was a very, very uh, special for a number of reasons. I had so many of the closest people that I cherished there. But for me, it really just concreted the reality that this was my choice. This was my decision because of how deeply I wanted to follow Jesus. And then I went back to school, and it was my senior year. And my whole narrative and how I looked at life, how I looked at people, how I looked at my teachers, all of those things began to shift. And like I shared with you Friday night, I began to look not so much of what I was getting out of it, but on what I could give. And I believe the greatest gift that Jesus gave us is the gift of giving. Not so much what we receive, but what we are willing to give. And I believe that's the the background and the essence and the foundation for evangelism, the the root of what our story is all about. We don't tell our story to brag. We don't tell our story because we're so proud of where we've come from. We tell our story because of what we know Jesus has done in our life. And we want other people to know what he can do for them. There is no earthly story which will ever compare to his story, however. Not my story, not your story, not Abraham's story or David's story or Ruth's story or Mary's story. No book, no movie, no television show, no YouTube sensation or internet influencer will ever come close to the sheer unreachable magnitude of God's desire to create in us his own. When we talk about his story, we go back to the very beginning. We go back to Genesis. And that is where the narrative shifts. Until this time, all heaven had been in order and in harmony and in perfect subjection to the government 
of God. And yet, in this period of time, Satan was once the honored angel in heaven next to Christ. But when God said to his son, let us make man in our own image, Satan got a little jealous. He wished to be consulted concerning the formation of man. And because he was not, he, he was filled with envy and jealousy and hatred. And he desired to receive the highest honor in heaven next to God. Until this time, heaven had been in perfect order. Until God said to his son, let us make man in our own image. And Satan said, hey, wait a second. What about me? Where's my input? Aren't I important enough here to be involved in this? Lucifer, Lucifer got distracted by the greatest thing that you and I get distracted. Lucifer tainted heaven with selfishness, with pride, and with jealousy, and with him a third of the angels were cast out. He felt that he should be an equal with God. He was not happy that God had a, was so excited about creating a new world and this people created in his image, and he wasn't a part of the plan. Genesis 1, 26 through 27 says, Then God said, and you guys all know this, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all over the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God did this. He created mankind in his own image, in the image of God. He created them male and female. He created them. God is all-knowing. Amen? Isaiah 46, 9 through 10 says, Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is none other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not yet been, saying my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. When God created everything upon this earth, he didn't see our fault. As much as we think about that, and I think we get wrapped up sometimes in the idea that, well, God's all-knowing, and, and so, you know, what was the deal? He, did he create us to be like some test, some proving ground? God, when God, I don't believe God created us. When he created us, when he created this earth, he created us not seeing a fall, not seeing our sin. He didn't see our reoccurring habit of turning away from him to follow our own desires. Over and over and over again through Genesis, we see God saying what? And God saw that it was good. From the very beginning of time, God saw goodness in each and every one of us. And from that point to now, God has continually been searching out the goodness in you and me. God didn't create us to solve the sin problem. We were not an experimental vaccine. We are not a glorified lab rat. God, lab rat. God did not create us to solve the sin problem. He created us in spite of the sin problem. His infinite understanding of love spurred him on, knowing that the power of love and the freedom to choose would ultimately gain the victory over sin. And in his great love for us, he also knew that part of his story would be sending his son, his one and only son, into the world he created. Not to condemn the world, but to save the world through the gift and the sacrifice of his son and the ultimate show of God's infinite love for you. And for me, for the first words of scripture to the last, we are given unending reassurance of God's desire to restore us to the glory he created in the beginning. And I love how Paul puts it in the book of Colossians. And if you have your Bibles or your phones or your laptops or whatever it is that you look your scriptures on, turn with me to the book of Colossians. 
We're going to be looking at uh, Colossians chapter 1. Chapter 1 and verses 15 through 22. And I believe this begins to paint a little bit more of his story to humanity. Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 through 22. And it says in verse 15, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in him all things were what? Created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. So when we get all worked up about the state of our nation or the state of our country or the state of our world, who ultimately is in control of all those things? Okay? Do we have anything to worry about if we know him? No. No. Verse 17, he is before all things, and in him all things, what? Exist. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. That's what I call restoration. That's what I call someone who is wanting to bring us back into his glory. He didn't yet, and yet that's not the end of it. Turn with me to Philippians. To Philippians, just back to a few pages, to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verses, starting with verse 5. And it's talking about the fact that despite... He had all reason for supremacy, all reason to brag, all reason to tell the story of his glory and the fact that he created it all. We find in Philippians that he didn't find equality with God, something to be used to his own advantage. Oftentimes, as Christians, we seem to like to take Christianity and use it to our advantage. Christianity is not a get-out-of-jail-free pass. (laughs) Christianity is not, I can go out and do whatever I want to do and be okay. Christianity, in the form that we see in Christ, is completely opposite to those things. Christianity will find, and how God showed us through his example, starting here in verse 5, In your relationship with one another, have the same same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself. By becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And because he did that, it says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Our world was looking for a hero. And in some respects, so are we. We want someone to come in and save the day. The world was looking for a hero. Jesus showed up and showed us humility. Our world was looking for a deliverer. And Jesus showed up and gave us the example of discipleship. Our world was looking for a savior. Jesus showed up and showed us a servant. Our world was looking for a way out. And Jesus came to show us the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't shock the world with revolution. He shared with the world his plan of restoration. 
He wasn't interested in the numbers. He didn't come with pomp and circumstance. He didn't come to rally the whole nation behind him. He didn't hold huge groups of people. And the people that came to him weren't advertised. They were naturally drawn to him. He usually started with one or two people and a personal conversation. And then somebody else said, hey, did you hear what he said? And then they came. And pretty soon, two became five, and five became 15, and 15 became 5,000. But numbers were not his focus. An individual conversation with a person directly in front of him was. Let's not get wrapped up in the numbers. Let's simply be concerned with our friend next door. His greatest desire was and is to do the will of his Father. And the will of the Father was and is to restore us to our original glory. That's the narrative of his story. We were created in his image. We were created for his Glory, and I know that because that's what it says in Isaiah. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43 and 1 through 13. Isaiah 43 and then verses 1 through 13. And there's a lot in here and there's a lot that I'm talking about tonight. So hopefully you're writing these verses down and go back and read them for yourself. But man, there's so much in them. It says, but now, in verse 1, but now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have restored you. I have summoned you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And then jump over to verse 5, and it says, Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and say to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, who I have created for what? My glory. Whom I have formed and I have made And we talked about that this morning, about how we are fearfully and wonderfully made. There was no one like you in the world. There will be no one in eternity like you. You are the only one with your story, right? Lead out those who have eyes but are blind, who have ears but are deaf. All the nations gathered together and the people assemble. Which of their gods foretold this and proclaimed to us the former things? Let them bring their witnesses to prove that they are right. And this is where we come into play again, my friends, so that others may hear and say, it is true. For he says in verse 10, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord. Your story and my story is the witness of the power and the love and the mercy and the justice of God. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me there is no Savior. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed. I am not some foreign God among you. You, he says it again, you are my what? That's right, declares the Lord. That I am God. Yes, and from ancient days I am he. No one can deliver out of my hand. And when I act, who can reverse it? We were created to be witnesses of his glory. We were created not to prove that He was some great God and all these things, but we were created to show that love, His love, His mercy, ultimately is 
eternal and everlasting, and nothing can thwart it. Nothing that Satan, nothing that the world, nothing that anything can come against his power and his love. He can't help but restore. He can't help but redeem. He can't help but save. And my story, your story, our story is the witness to his justice and mercy and of his forgiveness and redemption. It is so much of who he is that even as he was lay, even as he was laying, hanging on the cross next to criminals, he couldn't help himself, right? This is one of my favorite illustrations of who Jesus is and who he was and who he will be. He's on the cross. He's hanging there. He's in his last breath. Right after this moment, he took his last breath and said, into your hands I commit my spirit. But just prior to this, two criminals on either side of him, one of them saying, hey, if you really are the Messiah... Save yourself and us, right? Taunting him. And yet, in that moment, restoration still was taking place. In that moment, on the cross, as he hung there, knowing that he was going to be separated from his heavenly Father, in that moment where everything looked dark, a human being was pleading for restoration. And the God who loves you loved that thief on the cross. And he said, today, today, you will be with me in paradise. The beauty and the power of what God is willing to do for you and me is represented in those last moments. He will never give up on you and me. He is always looking for an opportunity, even on the cross. If he saw the worth in a thief on a cross, what do you think he sees in you? I will leave you with this final powerful illustration of what is to come if you, if I, if we are willing to allow Jesus to continue to be the author of my story, of your story, of our story. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9. And I believe his story is a story that he perpetually looks to to this day. I believe when he created us, he saw the whole story laid out before him. And he knew that there was going to be pain. He knew that there was going to be suffering. But he also knew that because of his love and his sacrifice, that a great multitude would gather. Gather not here, but in heaven. And starting with verse 9, it says, And after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, from every tribe, from every people, from every language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell down to their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And this right here is, I, I love this part. And then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? 
And where did they come from? And I answered, sir, you know. And he said, yes, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eye. I am a believer in the power of a good story. And boy, oh, howdy, that's a good story. I'm a believer in the ability of a story to change the course of history, and I believe that Jesus changed the course of history. I'm a believer that we are in the midst of actively living out the greatest story ever told. I believe that there's a crucial moment in each one of our lives when the narrative shifts and when we realize that this isn't my mother's story or my father's story. This isn't my grandpa or my grandma or my aunt or my uncle's or my neighbor's or my best friend's story. This is my story. And the reality sets in that what gets written down next is up to me. How the narrative progresses from here on out is up to the choices I make right now. My story, your story, his story is not about endings, but about new beginnings. The happy ending we are looking for isn't dependent on where we choose to end the story, but in realizing that our story doesn't have to end. It's in realizing that this is merely chapter one. My story is unique. Your story is special. His story far outranks any New York Times bestseller. Because he is the author. He is the creator. He is the one and only. The author and finisher. The author of our story wants to be the author of your neighbor's story, of your friend's story, of, the friend, of someone that you've just come in contact with. He wants to change lives. And he can do that when we are willing to tell our story. That's what I call a good story. That's what I call good news. Don't you think that that's a story worth being shared? Don't you think that's a story worthy of being told and retold until we see him in that great multitude face to face? I don't know about you, but man, that's a story that I want to share. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for each person who has taken time out of their life uh, to spend time in this moment. Lord, we just pray that uh, during this time that, uh, Lord, each of us has realized how important we are to you. Lord, that you would have come down for one person, that you would have given your son so that one person can continue their story. And Lord, we just pray that this evening that we don't squander the gift that you've given us, but that we confidently and excitedly and in a still, small voice prayerfully share how you have led in our lives so that others may come into a greater, better, fuller understanding of how you want to lead and author their story. So that when we are around that tree of life, and when that great multitude is glorifying you, those who we come in contact with in this community aren't forgotten, 
but they are standing with us side by side, praising your name and glorifying your sacrifice. May that happen and may it happen soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 457. 457. We'll just sing the first and the last first. 457. Let's stand. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know tis true and sad. Satisfies my longing as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story, will be my theme and glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love. Tell the story for those who know it best. Seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And when in scenes of glory I sing the new, new song, twill be. That I have loved so long I love to tell the story Will be my theme and glory To tell the old, old story Of Jesus and his love And now it says to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, right now and forevermore. Amen.